Okay, good morning. I'm glad to see everybody this morning. We've been having a few technical get difficulties, but we're ready to go. So why don't you all stand with us and let's start worshiping together. sanctuary we're so glad to have you here with us but more important aren't you glad that God is with us the Bible tells us that God inhabits the praise of his people that's one of the things I love about music whenever when we sing praises and we offer praises to God his presence is a part of that and that's an awesome thing you know the, also the New Testament tells us that where two or three are gathered in his name guess what the Holy Spirit is there so whatever's going on in your life today God's here 
He wants to be a part of what's going on. And that's, that's a good thing. That's one of the reasons I love coming to church is no matter what's happening in my life outside, if I can just focus for a minute and I can come into the sanctuary of, of, of a church and I can just let his presence be a part of my life, it changes everything. And I hope that that's happening with you because life's hard. Life's challenging. You know, in a, in a day like today, I was thinking just this morning, you know, when we come together, we have a prayer time and we think about those who uh, need special prayer. You know, one of our longtime members, a close friend of mine, asked if we'd specifically lift up his son, Sam. We've been praying for Sam. He's had cancer. He's been battling cancer now for quite some time. And, you know, the up and down battle that, that oftentimes goes with that. We've been praying and had a lot of good reports. And just this past week, found that things had come back and he's going to be in need of a bone marrow transplant. And, um, you know, it's a, it's, a tough, it's a tough blow. Tough blow, you know, to, to get that news about one of your children, you know? And so we want to pray for, for Sam Turner and lift up Claude and uh, everybody in that situation, number of other folks who are going through tough times. You know, every bit of news we get isn't always good news, but it's just the way life works. Then just immediately after that conversation where my heart is kind of heavy and I feel for a father who says, man, I'd do anything to trade places with my son. I see coming in the corner, I see a brand new baby Owen. First Sunday in church, and a sister who's like so proud, this is my little baby, brother Owen. Life is like this, man. It's, it's, it's a spectrum that's, that's full of highs and lows, and we're, we're trying to figure out how to make it through life. And that's why it's so important that we invite God to be a part of what we're doing. You know, he, he's always there. He's always present. He's always working. But oftentimes, we are the ones that don't see him. And so I hope that as we worship today, our songs, our prayers, what we do downstairs, all of our activities would bring honor and glory to him. And we'd remember that he's with us when things are tough, and they will be. I mean, if you're going through tough stuff today, I want you to know he's with you. If things are great and everything's going wonderful, he's still with you. Give him praise, give him honor, and give him glory. That's what he wants from us. I hope that our experience today, whether it's here, whether it's watching, I know we have a lot of folks traveling who's asked for prayers and safety as they go on vacation. I hope that wherever you are, that you'll pause for a minute, and as I pray, you'll invite God's presence to be a part of your life, specifically in the next few moments. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for all that you do for us. God, we lift up those who need a special prayer today. We pray in Jesus' name, Lord, for Sam. We pray for healing. We pray for comfort. We pray that you would be with their entire family. We pray for a positive match to be found for this bone marrow procedure. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling, many who are going through difficulty in relationships and they don't know what to do. We pray that you would give them strength. Well, for those who have emotional and financial struggles, we pray, Lord, that your blessings and clarity would be upon them. And Lord, we're so grateful for the good things, so many of them, blessings that are showered down upon us in so many ways. Help us to let our gratitude and thankfulness overflow to you and your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we spend the next few minutes together, we lift up your great name, the great name of Jesus Christ, the name that is above every name, the name that there is no salvation in any other name, the great name of our Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You know, today is Memorial Day, a day where we honor those who have fallen in service to this country. We got a little video, and I want you to, to see. Technical deal there, right?
Amen. You know, this weekend we, uh, we remember people who've, who've given us a real world example of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made when he laid down his life for us. Um, it, it doesn't get much closer than that. Um, but anyway, let's, let's stand together as we remember. Uh, let's stand together and worship.
at Children's Church. For those who are staying, if you have a Bible, I want to ask you to turn to Acts chapter 4. We're going to pick up on our series through the book of Acts. Maybe you use a phone or a tablet or some other mechanism to get the word delivered to you. We all will have it on the screen, but we're following along in the text of Acts, which we've stated is the story of the early church and how it became the Christian church instead of a part or a sect of Judaism, which it, at this point was really just coming out of. I'm not going to ask you to stand today. We're going to look at the first 22 verses. And the way I'm going to do this today is just read some of the text, tell you the story. 
there's so much in this. Um, it's, I had literally had four different sermons I wanted to do. But I figured that, that one was all you would be able to stand. So I just tried to merge some things together. I'm really going to tell you the story. And I cannot emphasize enough, when we look at narrative in the New Testament, okay, I want you to just pause for a minute. Lots of emotions are in your mind. Lots of things are going on. You're thinking about what you got to do later on today. You're thinking about what you got this week. I want you to just pause for a minute today. And I want you to listen to the story of some of our founding fathers in the faith, okay? We are, we're, we're on a day like Memorial Day, and Oliver very appropriately pointed out that, that the men and women who gave their life in service to this country demonstrated by their sacrifice how important this country was to them. Even when they didn't agree with everything about it, they, they gave their life in service to this country, and we're beneficiaries of their sacrifice. Well, in some ways, these disciples and these apostles that we're going to look at today, they gave their life as well, especially Peter, in service to the church. And so we're going to learn something about his story today. And so I want you to really focus in and ask God to speak to you in this story. What is it I should walk away from as we look at the story? It starts in chapter 4, and it begins... Speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. Now, a point of context, we looked last week, what were they speaking about? So the context of the story is the miracle, if you weren't here, whenever Peter and John were walking into the temple, and they saw the guy who was lame, he was begging for money, he'd been outside the temple for his whole life, and he, the guy wanted money from him. Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but I will give you what I do have. And so he says, be healed, get up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. Miraculous event takes place. And then, if you remember, Peter begins to address the crowd. He takes advantage of that opportunity. And so many people are coming to faith in Christ because of Peter and John's bold preaching, as well as the signs and the miracles that were being performed. And here is today's story. While they were speaking, they were confronted by the priest, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. Now, I want you to just pause for a moment and put all of this into context. It was just a few weeks ago that there was someone else of significant importance who was standing before who? The priests, the Sadducees, and the religious leaders. So keep that in mind. It's less than three months for sure since Jesus has been standing in this very place with them, okay? Now, these leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. Now, I want you to think for just a moment. Of all of the things to be disturbed about, if three months ago you had condemned Jesus to die and really pressed and manipulated the system to make sure that he was crucified instead of a criminal, and there was hundreds of people who told you that he was back alive again, and the people who say they're following him just got made a man get up and walk who'd been crippled for 40 years, of all the things in the world to be disturbed about, what they're teaching about should not have been what disturbed them. They should have been disturbed. But they should have been disturbed by the fact that, whoa, did we get it wrong? Now, I, I don't want you to miss this. Because they, they literally didn't see reality in the same way that you and I can see it. And certainly didn't see it the way God saw it. And we must pause for a moment because you can be zealous, you can be committed, you can be firm, and you can be firmly wrong. These folks were disturbed, but for all the wrong reasons. I meet people today who are disturbed, and they're upset about things. But I think oftentimes they're kind of like these folks. They're upset for all the wrong reasons. They were very upset, so much upset that they did what? They threw Peter and John in jail in the evening so they could, you know, sit in the cooler for a night. 
All right? Let them, let them think about it, okay? But many of the people who heard their message believed it. Understandable. Just 90 days ago or so, there's a man who claimed to be God. They crucified him. He rose from the dead. A whole bunch of people saw it. He'd already done a bunch of miracles. These folks here come back and they say, we saw him. They raised a guy there. I mean, this is a, now it's beginning to get a little bit believable. At some point, the, oh, the evidence is starting to overwhelm you. This is one thing I love about that song, that evidence song. I mean, if you, if you truly stop, apparent realities are in front of them. But their takeaway is so messed up that you're wondering, what planet do they live in? They can't even see what's happening here. This is nothing new under heaven. So, but many people see the overwhelming evidence of Jesus' message and they believe, and it gives us a number, that now there's about 5,000 men. Now, this is a follow-up to what we saw in Acts chapter 2 where there were 3,000 people who came to Christ initially. So get the context here. We've got now 5,000 men, which means there's probably at least 5,000 women, children, and other folks in the periphery who now have decided that, wait a minute, that we, we, made the bad, we made a bad choice here. They were cut to the quick. They've been, they decided that Jesus maybe was who he said he was. Now, so there's, there's an emerging movement of people who are going to probably challenge the religious leaders. So this is the context of our story. The next day, the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. They're concerned. Again, they're, all, they're concerned for all the wrong reasons, but they are concerned. Now it's not just Jesus and the crowd can't be manipulated. It's, a, it's a, about five to 10,000 people who very much believe that Jesus is who he says he was. So they need to figure out, what do we do? It gives a list of the people who were there. Annas, the high priest, was there, along with Caiaphas. He was mentioned in the gospel narratives. John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name? It's fascinating to me that these people are so confused about what's happened here. They stood before Jesus. You, think, you would think that, man, at some point the light's going to come on and I'm going to be like, let me pump the brakes here and figure out how to right the ship. And here's what I want you to understand. Because this illustrates a very unique thing about human beings. They have, we have, I have the ability to create false perceptions that I'm willing to hold on to in spite of the evidence and against all reality to the contrary. We see people in the world like this today. These people were very important religious figures, but they were so willing and so set on holding on to their own power and their own influence and their own perception of who God was, that they missed God. Now I want you to just wrap your brain around something like that. It'll go over your head if you're not careful. They allowed their perception of who God was to keep them from meeting God. I stand before you today and tell you there are people today who have allowed their perception of who God is to cause them to miss God. This is very, very dangerous. So, they aren't open to any new realities, to learning anything new, and so they demand what has happened here. We jump down to the next little section of the scriptures. We see Peter's response. It says in verse 8, Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. So, They've sat in the jail cell all night. They've been in the cooler and probably were not treated as VIPs. 
okay? It was probably a rough night. But after a rough night in the cooler, they're brought, because we know the same people who did this were the ones who did what to Jesus. These are not good people. These people are cruel. These people are merciless when they are in defense of God's honor. Listen, you don't, don't worry about God's honor. God can worry about his own honor. When you, when you start trying to hurt people and do things wrong in God's name to honor him, just you're off track. But that's what these people were doing. And so it's probably a tough night. They bring him back, and then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says to them this answer. I mean, he's a little sarcastic at first. He's like, I mean, really? Are we here? He's like, let's cut to the chase. We're not here because we helped a cripple guy. No. What? You want to know how we did it. I like this. I like this. He doesn't beat around the bushes. We're not going to have a religious conversation about it. He says, nope, you want to know how I was healed. And I like this. He says, let me clearly state so that you don't get it misunderstood, so that my words can't be twisted up. Let me tell you clearly what happened here. This man was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. I don't think that's the answer they wanted to hear. We're going to find out. But certainly they did not want to hear it. Peter here filled with the Holy Spirit, has a tremendous boldness. You know, if you don't have that level of boldness, if you struggle to bring, bring honor to God and to do what he wants you to do, maybe it's the fact that you're not allowing your life to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to step up and rise up to the occasion when he needs you, whatever that may be. Some of you are in tough places. I mean, you, got, you literally are going to have to have the Holy Spirit in your life to rise to the occasion to deal with what you're dealing with. Whether it's the, the loss of a child or a loved one, whether it's a, an illness, whether it's a tough deal at work, whatever it is, you, you're going to have to step up and be bold like Peter was. This isn't the main point of today, but I want to make an interesting point here that I noticed about Peter and John. Clearly, Peter and John were falsely accused. They were imprisoned unjustly. They were offended wrongly. But notice that they did not allow the offense to distract them from the mission. Many, many people in this world are allowing the wrongs that other people have done to them to keep them from fulfilling the mission God has for them. This is what's wrong for people who are always offended. If you're always offended, if you're always feeling wrong, if you're always feeling like, well, they did this to me, you know what? They may have. It's very likely because it's a broken world and broken people do broken things. But if you live in a world of offense, you will be ineffective in what it is that God has for you. Now, because you pressed on through the wrongs that were done to you, through the offensive, unjust, unequal, unequal actions that were done to you, it doesn't justify the actions of the persons who did it. What you do has no bearing on them. Let God be their judge. But you stay focused on the mission at hand. In my life, the minute that I get twisted up worrying about how I've been wronged, I lose all my effectiveness. You notice when Jesus was on the cross, he's the pinnacle example. What did he say? He didn't say, you sorry rascals, y'all spit in my face. I'll show you. You plucked out my beard, I'm going to get you. You put a crown of thorns on my head, you're going to get it, Jack. You're a terrible person. No. What did he say? Father, forgive them. Because they don't really know what they're doing. Man, that's hard. But this is how you can become a person who God uses in powerful ways. Maybe in your heart you take offense at everything. Somebody says something that bothers you and you get offended. Or they did this or they did that. That's not of God, friend. You gotta, you gotta really ask him to help you let go of these things. It's not a justification. It's not you saying that you're agreeing with what they're doing. No, it's not saying, notice Peter and John didn't become a doormat for them. 
and let them do that. They just averted that and said, nope, stick into what I got to do because I can't get lost in what was done to me. So they preached this. And then we find, start there in verse 11, an interesting statement. It says, for Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Now, in this moment, filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter refers back to a couple of scriptures that these Pharisees would know. One of them is Psalms 118, I believe, verse 22. Don't hold me to the verse. And Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. And both of these are where it says basically that God is going to lay a, in Isaiah a cornerstone in Zion that everything is going to be built on. Psalms 118 says that, that, that God sends a cornerstone, but the builders reject the cornerstone. And so you may ask, what exactly is a cornerstone? Okay, so a cornerstone is, is the stone that they set first in the ancient world that had significance, number one, kind of a ceremonial significance, and we still hold that today. But for them, it was even more of a significance because their construction was different than ours, okay? They used rock, stone, clay. It was, it was the stone that they set that really laid the foundation for the rest of the house that was built. And, you know, we kind of have some of that today. You know, when we build a house today, whenever the dirt pad is set, if any of you ever built anything, you know that that dirt pad is set. And then they come and they pick a corner, and that one particular corner is where you orient everything else from, okay? You pull your lines, and if you're a math person, you know, you, you get the, the angles and what's perpendicular and all the hypotenuses and all that kind of stuff. But it's all kind of centered around what is the corner that is the benchmark. And so basically, Peter says, Jesus is the cornerstone. A little bit worse than that on them, he says, because the stone that you builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is a major insult, if you will, to say, and, but it's nothing new. But they say emphatically, Jesus is the cornerstone. But he doesn't just leave the imagery there, or the analogy. Look what he says further. He says, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And this echoes Jesus' words where he stood and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Friends, this is a point at which the scriptures are very clear in the exclusive nature of Christianity. This is one of the reasons why you can't hold a completely universalist worldview where it says Jesus is a good person and he's a great teacher and he wants everybody and everybody's going to all get there, choose the road, and just all, all roads lead to heaven. Man, I wish that were true. I hope that would be true. But the problem is that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said that, that he was the way, the truth, the life. The apostles, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, said there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be, must be saved. Now, I can tell you this. That does not mean, however, that there's a formula that you control or that you've got a monopoly on how it works. So don't get confused there because I think a lot of people take it a little too far. They you know, salvation comes through Jesus, but let's trust Jesus to know how that's going to play out. But I can tell you this, it doesn't come through anywhere else. It comes through Jesus. One interesting point here. Just a few weeks ago, whenever Jesus was standing before these folks, I don't know what this means, but it's just an interesting thing of the story. Notice Jesus never gave him any of these answers. He was very elusive. They kept asking him what? Questions. Who are you, this or that? And he pretty much gave them what? He didn't give them what they wanted. But now the disciples aren't holding back. And I don't know if, if the reason for that is Jesus was allowing them 
to be able to, to step up and do this, but it's, it's an interesting point of the story, is, is Jesus didn't give them the answers they wanted. He, just, he didn't even refuse to answer them. But the apostles here are giving them the truth straight out. Now, when they do that, like many of us, whenever we get a truth that we don't like, it's, it's troubling. So we see starting in verse 13, their reaction. It says, the members of the council, which is all these religious leaders, were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. Okay, they're amazed. These guys, a fisherman and a nobody, have deep understanding because of the being the fact that they're filled with the Holy Spirit. So, so there's a certain level of awareness amongst these leaders. They all, also recognized that they were men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. Now, this fascinates me. I can't help but use that word. I mean, we see clearly that these people should not be able to speak like they're speaking, Peter and John. They're Galilean fishermen, okay? We see this guy over here who's walking who shouldn't be walking. We hear what they're saying, but the, there's like a disconnect. They can't seem to get it. They have hardened their hearts to such an extent that no amount of information will open their eyes to the reality that God wants them to see in Jesus. So they, what do we do? We can't deny they performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. How a council of intelligent people came up with this as the solution is bewildering to me. But it should be no more bewildering to us than the nonsense we come up with in the face of overwhelming evidence. As a believer in Jesus Christ, baptized into faith, buried with Him, raised to walk in new life, I know for an absolute fact that God's got my back. God loves me. He cares for me. He died for me. But let a few bunch of things go wrong and what might I do? Woe is me. Poor me. Let, some, let a few deals go bad on somebody. Well, God's not going to take care of me. That's just as bewildering. This is the part of being human that's tough. We, we struggle. We have to continually redirect our minds, redirect our hearts to the reality of what God is doing because if not, we, we drift further and further away until we could possibly get to a point like these folks where they were so consumed by religion and what they thought God was that they were completely lost to everything God was about. So they tell them, we're going to warn them not to speak. They called the disciples back in in verse 18 and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. I don't think that went too well for them. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? Now I want you to take that question a moment that, that Peter asked those religious leaders. And I want you to read it with me in your mind. You don't have to read it out loud. But I want it to be a question you ask yourself. Do you think God wants you to obey others rather than Him? You see, when we're confronted with people, things, systems, organizations that move us in a different direction than God, we choose who we're going to follow. We choose whether we're going to obey our God. 
They replied, obviously, that we cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they did not want or know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. Unique little situation. Parallels in many ways Jesus' encounter with these religious leaders. And there are a number of things that we could make of it, but, but I, I really want to hone in on a question today. Certainly, <clears throat> there's things that we could learn about the response of these religious leaders. And absolutely, I hope that you and I would look at what took place in their life and would make sure that we don't allow those types of thoughts and feelings to happen in our own life. Because remember, religion can really get you off track. It has value, and it, it, it has value whenever it's placed and it's demonstrated in the truth of Jesus. But when it becomes more of our perception and what our beliefs are than what we know to be true or what Jesus said was true, things can get out of whack in a hurry. So we want to look at that. There's some things that we could look at about Peter and John here that should inspire us. Man, they rose to the occasion. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, Peter, you're talking about a change in 90 days, right? 90 days ago, he was sitting outside the campfire, and he was like, I don't even know the guy. You know, he was scared. He was scared of even the common people. And now he's looking the head guy that was, that was grilling Jesus dead in his face. And he said, look, I'm not backing down one bit, dude. This was done in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's don't even waste time talking about all the this and that. This is the reality. So, I mean, that's boldness. That's power under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And certainly, we should aspire to this. They didn't get distracted by what was going on, all of the other stuff. Those are things we can learn. Awesome. But this particular passage, the central idea here that we're revealed is that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of our faith. At this particular point, not everyone understood this. Jesus was somewhat parabolic in the way he talked, somewhat elusive in his communication with other people and different things. But now the church leaders under the direction of the Holy Spirit are starting to clarify what Jesus meant, who Jesus was. And this is one of those very, very important things where he says the stone that the builders rejected, that, that the Jewish people rejected, had now become the cornerstone of our faith. The song that Oliver and the, and the, and the folks sang earlier, which we're going to sing in just a minute, just a little reprise of that, about the cornerstone. That's, that's where that comes from, is that Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith. You know, as he comes to lead us in a reflection of that song, I want to ask you a couple of questions. And really, they center around this. Um, what, in a metaphorical sense, maybe, what's your cornerstone? I mean, what is, what is the, the foundation of your life? The foundation of your faith? Is it Jesus Christ or is it in your perception of who God is? Is it in your ability to be a good person? Is it maybe the faith of your parents? Maybe you don't know. According to the New Testament, Jesus is our cornerstone. And if you don't know what your cornerstone is today it's time to solidify that make jesus the cornerstone of your life what does that mean see that's that's all language that's, that's somewhat hard to understand right what it mean the the cornerstone of your life what do you place your foundation in when you encounter terrible things in life like a child 
whose cancer comes back. Or the, the loss of a child. Or, or a bankruptcy. Or a, a foreclosure. Or a severe illness. Or a moral failure in your life or in somebody you trusted. What's your foundation when these things happen? Do you, do you cave in and fall? Or are you so grounded in who Jesus is that you can withstand the storms of life. You know, when they set that cornerstone, how it's turned basically orients the building. What orients your life? I mean, which, which way are you oriented? Are you oriented towards Jesus and what he wants to do in your life? To try and follow his teachings? Or do you sometimes feel like you're a little off kilter? Like maybe the, the direction's off. And here's the thing. In my experience in building, when you get the direction off, it creates a lot of chaos the whole way through. Let, let the orientation get off on one corner and then the squares don't work. The shape isn't right. Maybe even the stability just don't work out right. You know, Oliver is a civil engineer, and he does a lot of work with companies and municipalities and streets. And, and I bet, I didn't talk to him about this, but I bet if somebody started out to construct something and they got the orientation of the road wrong at the front end, it wouldn't line up with where it's going. And let me tell you today, if your orientation is off, you're not going to end up where you need to be. If your orientation is off of Jesus, friend, the destination is not where you're going to want to be. Today is the day to reorient and place your life firmly built on the foundation of the cornerstone. Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us today to place our faith and trust in your son Jesus as the cornerstone of all that we are about. In the areas in which we have failed, we ask for forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to follow through with repentant action. Help us today wherever we are in our journey to dedicate the foundation and orientation of our life to your son Jesus Christ. We ask this in his precious name. Why don't you stand with us and sing this song together.
celebrate every week Jesus' blood and his righteousness through communion. We're going to have someone do a communion meditation in just a moment. I want to invite you to participate with us in that. If you don't have a um, communion cup, feel free to grab one of those in just a minute. You know, as we think about the, uh, those Pharisees, those religious leaders, they missed it. We don't want to miss it. We don't want to miss it. We want to recognize Jesus for who he is and what he does. Let's partake in the communion together. We're so thankful that you chose to be a part of worship with us today. I hope that it's been an experience where God spoke to you, and maybe you'll continue building on that, maybe as you read the scriptures, as he continues to speak to you. I want you to plug into the things that apply to you. Summertime's a very unique time. A lot of people are in and out traveling. I want everybody to be safe, have a good time with that as well. But when you're in town, make sure and try to be here uh, for church. You know, they do have the different venues online that you can check us out, and I know that that's uh, important to see what's going on. Don't miss and forget how important it is those who gave their life for us. First and foremost, Jesus Christ. But many others gave their life not even knowing us for our freedom. So tomorrow when we have a barbecue, when we go swimming or we go to the lake, when we have a good time with our family, which are all very appropriate things, right? They're celebratory activities. Why don't we pause for just a minute, maybe with our kids, with our grandkids, and just say, hey guys, you know why we're off today? It's a, it's a memorial day where we remember those who gave their life for this country and its causes. So, you know, if, no, if we don't continue to teach boys and girls and don't stand up for these things, History oftentimes is lost, and we don't want that to, to happen, certainly not on something as important as uh, a Memorial Day. I hope that you have a great week and that, that God blesses you and, and shows you favor in all that you're doing. Bob, why don't you lead us in our closing prayer? Father, well, we are so thankful that uh, we have direction in this life. And Father, when we align with the cornerstone of Jesus Christ, our life and we pray, Father, that we might seek him out, we might seek that cornerstone, might orient our life to his life. That, Father, as we remember those that have fallen in this country, the defense of this country, we pray, Father, that we will keep our minds straight, keep our hearts right, and help us to love them, love this country, and most of all, Father, love you.